I want to talk to you uh, this, this morning, uh, God's program of love. And I hope that you love me after I'm done. <laughs> because it'll be challenging. It'll be, some things will be challenging, but that's okay. Because really, the, the, the whole focus of this message is that you would have an encounter with God's love. That's the focus of this message this morning. And that's, that's something that I've been praying for and so forth. But anyway, God's program of love, and in particular today, what I want to focus on is that God loves you. So my first question is, uh, for us this morning, is what is God like? What is God like? Now, that's a good question, which requires a, a satisfactory answer. What is God like? I know, I know there are all sorts of people in this world that come up with all kinds of ideas, what God is like and so forth. Religions in the world that come to their conclusions. Some of them actually, apparently, have had some encounters with a spiritual being, and they arrive at their own conclusion what God is like. What is God like? Well, you know what? I've got a real reliable source which sheds great amount of information as to what God is like. And it's the Word of God. It is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. Not our governments, not any other book. This is the absolute Word of God. From page to page, from cover to cover. It is the Word of God. And it reveals to us who God is, and what He is like. Now, let me say this too. You realize the enemy has attacked the Word of God ever since it has been in place. Throughout church history, this book has been attacked time and time again. In fact, the Roman Empire tried to confiscate all documents, but they couldn't. <laughs> They got rid of a whole pile of documents. But you know what the Christians did? They kept recopying. They kept copying over and over and over again. And the enemy could not succeed. Amen. And so to this day, we have the Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have the Word of God. In fact, they ha there are documents that can be dated now to almost 50 years within the time that Jesus was here on the face of the earth. That's awesome. But we have this incredible, reliable source. It's not based on the philosophies of man, but rather God himself reveals to us what he is like. Throughout the Old Testament, we find that God gradually, gradually would reveal himself to the people of Israel as to who he was and what he was like. So when we're talking about what God is like, we're talking about the character of God. And one aspect that we want to zoom in today concerning his character is the love of God. I know, I know, I know. We've heard this topic again and again. But you know what? I'm going to take a shot at it. I'm going to take a shot at it. And we're going to be talking about it. Amen. Praise the Lord. God, number one, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. When you look at this particular verse, right from the very beginning, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Because where does love come from? It comes from God. And whoever loves has been born of God. That means if you really walk in love, you've been born again. You're a child of His, glory to God. And you know Him. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So when we're talking about God is love, we're talking about the character of God. Love describes his character and the heart of God because that's who he is. He is rich in love and compassion. And we find when Jesus was here on the face of the earth, Jesus demonstrated God the Father. He represented him. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus, when he came, he represented God the Father completely. And he showed how much love and compassion he had for the people. Like, for instance, in the feeding of the 4,000. He was moved with compassion. 
In the feeding of the 5,000, it was the same story. He was moved with compassion. In the healing of the sick, you have several stories how Jesus was moved with compassion concerning the people that were sick. At times, he would even cry. Because that's how much he cared for the people. Now, let's look at that verse number 8 again. It says this, anyone who does not love does not know God. Did you hear that? Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That's who he is. And if we don't love God, we obviously are on the opposite side. So obviously there has to be resentment, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. That's what would rule the heart of man. And guess what? That's exactly what's happening right now. It doesn't matter where you go. There's so much hatred. And you don't even have to go to another country in the world. It's right here in North America. The, the amount of hatred that's being dispelled is amazing. The amount of hatred. That's not God. Because the Bible says God is love. So anyone who says, oh, yeah, we believe in God. Big, hairy deal. <laughs> because it says here God is love. He's the source of love. So we're talking about the character of God. But I want to say this too. Number two. Love is not God. I might have burst your bubble. But that's okay. Because love is not God. And I want you to, to really take a hold of that. Because that is the, exactly the case. Because if love is God. Then there is no such thing as justice. Justice. There's no righteousness. There's no holiness. Because all there is is just love. And it's based on mankind. And that's been redefined as well. It's like saying, I look at the tree and I see God. The tree is God. Or I look at nature. That's God. No, that's false. When I look at these things, I see the beauty of, of nature, and I see the mountains, I see the animals, and I see the birds. You know what? We were in Anaheim uh, a, about a year and a half ago, and we went to this museum. And it was amazing, all these birds that I saw from various countries of the world. Amazing colors, the combinations. It was amazing, all different sizes of birds. And what can you say? You have to come to the conclusion that God created it all. God made it all. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky, the firmament above proclaims his handiwork. All these things were made by God. And God did not say that we're to look at the, at the animals and look at them and say, I see God, that's God. Could you just imagine? When God, on that first, or the first few days when he created various things, he looked at the whale and he said, boy, do I ever look good. <laughs> Is that what God said? Yeah. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, it, it is good. He made it for us. See, love has been so redefined. And it's not the God kind of love. Instead, it is this squishy, namby-pamby, have a nice day kind of love that values being nice more than wanting what is really best for the other person. It's about being nice. I'm not against being nice. But that's not what true love is. That's not the God kind of love. You know, that's exactly what's being, being uh, uh, broadcast or propagated uh, nowadays. The be nice. Be nice to one another. Don't hurt anybody. Don't say something that might offend somebody. That's not God's love. It is not. And I want us to get that through our mind. Because that's exactly what the world is communicating. That we are to be nice to one another. All the religions accept each other. We're to be nice one to another. You dare not preach to, to, to other religions. That's exactly what's being said. Would be nice. Kevin, I'm going to be nice to you from this day forward. I'm not going to say nothing nasty. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm just going to be nice to you. Is that okay? Great, man. We got a deal. Whoa. 
But that's what's being propagated nowadays. Be nice. But when we're talking about God is love, we're also saying there is more to his character. It is true that love is the essential part of his character and colors every part of his nature. But you cannot eliminate things like holiness. You cannot eliminate things like righteousness, his perfect justice. That's part of his character as well. Not just love. However, we must understand as well that in holiness, God is loving. In righteousness, he's also loving. In justice, he is loving. That's who he is. But let me say this. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Really? Yes, that is true. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Adam and Eve are a perfect example of this. In the Garden of Eden, when God made Adam, he demanded obedience. And he spoke that from his heart of love for Adam. He said this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. That's what God said to Adam. And he spoke it from a heart of love. He didn't speak from the point of view of oh, I am nice to you. In fact, when, when Adam rebelled, God didn't say to, to Adam, oh, you poor thing. I, I, oh, man, you know what? I'll be nice to you. I'll just simply overlook this. That wasn't the case. In fact, Adam and Eve suffered the consequences of their rebellion against God. But, that, but did that change God? No, God was still a God of love. He still loved Adam and Eve. It doesn't change God. He's still a God of love. That's his character. That is, that's point number one. God is love. But we can't stop there. Because number two, we want to talk about God of action. Look at John chapter 3, verse 16. It says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Then 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 says this. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. His love is active. You see, God didn't just simply... Love Adam and Eve and gave him the, you know, if you fail, well then, that's too bad for you. No, God is a God who loves us. And he's not going to leave Adam and Eve in the place where they were at. Neither does he leave you and me in the place where we could stay, and that is in place of sin. But instead, we look at the situation concerning Adam and Eve. The consequences were harsh. They were horrible. In fact, man did die. He died physically and spiritually. But God provided a solution for them. By sacrificing an animal. And using the blood of that animal to cover his sin. Then he took the skin of this animal and clothed Adam and Eve. But we have here today the ultimate solution. And that is, we've just read it. In John chapter, six, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, and 1 John chapter 4, here God has a solution by sending or giving his son, sending his son. Two words. He gave and he sent his best, his son. Why? Because he loves us. It's all because of love. In spite of our sin, in spite of our rebellion, God still loves and he's done something about it. That's the beauty of the whole thing. And you look about, or you look at the accomplishment of what he, of, of Jesus coming into the world. 
It's beyond measure. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God did not wait for us to somehow clean up our act. God didn't wait that somehow we would come to him and love him and then he would send his son. No, while we were still in our sin, in our rebellion, the Bible says that God did something about it. Hallelujah. That's what he's done. He sent his son to die for us. What an incredible story it is. What an incredible feat that is that Jesus would come into this world to die for us. He would go to the cross. But you know what? Also, this morning, you don't have to wait. I know I've heard people say, you know what? My goodness, you don't know about my life. You don't know how bad things are in my life. You don't know how, how, what I've done and so forth. I said, you know what? It doesn't matter because it says here that while there were still sinners, Christ died for them. All he wants is us to run to him. Come as you are. The Billy Graham song, come as you are. How's it go again? Just as I am, without one plea, I come. The invitation goes out to all of us. Even in our personal struggles that we have, you don't have to wait to clean up. Go to him, glory to God. Let's look at the next verse. We looked at verse number 8 of 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Let's look at verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. My, everything he's done is done out of love. Love for who? For us. For us human beings, rebellious, rebels. Maybe you've got another word to describe yourself or to others. <laughs> but he loved us. It's not because we loved him, but he showed his love by sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation, what does that mean? It means atonement. It means that someone had to, to die for us, a sacrifice, a sacrifice to turn away the wrath of God. Listen, if Jesus wouldn't have done what he did, the wrath of God would abide on us and we wouldn't have a chance of ever being able to be free of sin ever. But when Jesus came, he made an atonement for us. He gave his life for us so that the wrath of God would be lifted off us. The judgment of God would be removed from us. Because whether you like it or not, mankind is guilty before God. Whether we know it or not, whether we want to accept it or not, doesn't make any difference. The truth is, we are guilty of sin. And because of sin, the Bible says we became enemies. Sin separates us from God. But even as a believer, I know there are some who, I know you, I'm going to have some <laughs> things being said, but I don't care. <laughs> because I know this. Even as a believer, even as a believer, we struggle with sin. There's some of us in this place, you struggle with sin. You struggle with things. You might be struggling with addictions. You might be struggling with pornography. You might be struggling with some other stuff. But guess what? Jesus died for you. He removed the wrath of God so you can run to him. That's what he's done. So you can be set free from the bondages of sin, the addictions, pornography, wrong thinking. Jesus went to the cross for you. And he's removed that wrath. So you can run to him and receive forgiveness, freedom. If you're not free today, you can be free indeed. Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free, glory to God. Because Jesus died for you, and he paid the price. See, you took the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus to turn away the wrath of God. Jesus met the demands of the law because we were worthy of death. But thank God for his love. He loves you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. He loves everyone in this world. He's not willing that any should perish. And as a believer, that you can walk in greater freedom than you've ever walked before. 
I thank God. There are things that I've experienced that I've shared just a little bit. But I know one thing. There's, there's one thing that I was set free from. I remember going when we first came to Victory Church. And I saw all these people dancing. And I know I come from a background where we used to do a lot of dancing. And my feet always want to go. <laughs> I always want to go. And so here I am at Victory Church. We start coming to, going to Victory Church in Calgary. And, and, uh, and I see this happening. But oh man, I felt like, man, this is really tough. Because, you know, that was a dance hall. This is not a dance hall. I said to myself. And I said, how can I do this? I want to do it, but I don't. One day, I said, I finally, I said to myself, God, you are my source. And I love you. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And when I start doing it, Hallelujah. There was freedom. There was freedom that came, glory to God. I was set free. And even today, I know my arm is, is sore, so I, but I'll tell you what, I, I was moving. But that was small. <laughs> because you know what? When you've got the joy of the Lord, how can you stand still and say, I love the Lord? And you say, well, I'm filled with joy, but nothing is moving. Nothing is moving. Glory to God. We need to get excited about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because he paid an incredible price so you can be free. Dr. James Montgomery Boyce of the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia said this. If God had merely sent Jesus to teach us about himself, that would have been wonderful enough. It would have been far more than we deserved. If God had sent Jesus simply to be our, our example... That would have been good too and would have been some value. But wonderful thing is that God did not stop with these, but rather sent his son not merely to teach or to be our example, but to die the death of a criminal that he might save us from sin. Hallelujah. Another commentary said this. This shows the love of God. God gave his son to die and to die for sinners. We can think of someone paying a great price to save someone deserving, someone good, someone noble, someone who had done much for them. But God did all this for rebels, for sinners, for those who had turned their backs on him. That's where we were. And there's some of us even sitting here. You're in a backslidden condition. You, have, you need to come back to him. The invitation is to you today. And that's my third point. We talked about God is love. God is a God of action. But the thing is, in spite of all these things that God has done, number three, God's love experienced. You see, God's love is to be experienced, and that's the invite to us today. God is inviting us to come to Him and experience His love to a greater degree than you have ever experienced before. Hallelujah. Listen to this passage of Scripture found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. It says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Because Paul understood the depth of God's love even for him who himself persecuted Christians and had Christians killed. And God showed his mercy. It had to be God's love. And he says, verse 15, From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. To know the love of Christ. That surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That passage of scripture is talking about, it's actually a prayer by Paul. He was praying for the Ephesians, and he was praying that they would experience and understand the, the, the hugeness of God's love, and to be able to know it, and to be filled with the fullness of God. His love, as I've been saying this morning, is inviting us 
to experience his love. Number one, first of all, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's number one. You need to come to know him as your Savior. That's number one. But number two, as believers... His love is inviting us to come to Him, to surrender ourselves to Him completely. And my encouragement to you today is that you would make a fresh commitment to prayer, a fresh commitment to reading His Word, a fresh commitment simply just surrendering to His Lordship. Make a fresh commitment to serving Him in a greater way than you have before. Because Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. You know that God longs? He so longs that we would come to him. Because there are people in this audience today, you are struggling with stuff. You come to this place and you, you've got your hair done up. Some of us that are bald, you haven't got much to fix. That's right, man. I can't even curl mine. And you can't either. That's right. But you know what? Something that I experienced in the last little while, it was like a revelation that came to me. It was like God was saying to me that I only serve him and I want to serve him perfectly. Because somehow, if I could just serve him perfectly, that I would get his approval. That I would experience his love to a greater degree. You know how many people that are in this place that have exactly that same place. That if you somehow can serve him or do things perfectly, that he would accept you. God wants you to be free from that. It's not about works. You see, God wants you to know that he loves you exactly the way you are. He loves you the way you are with all your struggles, with all your problems, whatever shortcomings you might have. And believe you me, some of us, like, I can look at my life and say, wow, man, shortcomings. Oh, man, Mr. Shortcomings. I can look at this, and we do this, and somehow we say to ourselves that maybe somehow if I can get over some of these shortcomings, then maybe I will experience his love, his acceptance, But that is false. God wants you to be free from that. He wants you to really experience his love. His love. I remember one day, uh, this is going back a few years ago, but I remember there was a lady in our church that was in the old building that we used to meet in. But I remember this, this woman who had a, she had a disease. And she wanted prayer. And I remember we were at this, we had a special event in our church at that that particular evening. It was an evening thing. And, and I remember I was outside and I came in and someone said, uh, you need to go to the prayer room because somebody wants, wants to talk to you. So I went. And this woman was just crying. There's other ladies surrounding her and so forth. And uh, finally, uh, this, this particular woman was able to share with me what was going on. And the thought that came to me is that that God wanted me to pray the Father's love to be poured out upon his daughter. That's all I did. I laid hands on her and I said, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, Father, that you just pour out your love upon this, your daughter. She was healed instantly. Because that's who God is. She was not perfect. She had shortcomings because I know that lady. But God demonstrated his love for her like he wants to demonstrate to you. You don't have to come to the place that somehow, some way, if I can just reach this pinnacle, then God would accept me. And here you are, a child of God. You're missing out what God has in store for you today. You know what? You can serve God for a long period of time. You could be in your 50s. You could be 60s. You could be 70s. You could be in your 80s. And you struggled with that all your life. God wants you to know that he really loves you. And he wants you to experience his love. And all he is doing or saying to you today, he's inviting you to come and run to him with all your struggles. Our grandson was not perfect. My daughter isn't perfect. 
but God touched and delivered him from fear. He wants to do the same for you today. Whoever you are. I know this message was short. We've got lots of time. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do, we're going to take up the offering, and then I want to give the opportunity to pray for you. It's time, folks. It's time that we get in touch with God. There's many of us that are struggling with this. I know there's some of you that are really struggling with this stuff. And you need to know that God loves you. And he wants you to experience his love. I don't care who you are. Praise God. Let's just close this part with prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to know that, God, you're real. That your love is real. And that your love is inviting us to experience you in a greater way. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you for it. We just give you the glory. You deserve it all. You are a mighty God. You're a glorious God. You're the great I am. You're the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You are a glorious God, and we praise you and we thank you for that. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.